from a sacred space in a city called Pasadena Presbyterian Church, this is an invitation to worship for you. Join us at the same time each week, and when you can, join us in person any Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Pasadena Presbyterian Church is located at the corner of Colorado Boulevard and Madison Avenue in the Playhouse District in Pasadena, California. And now, in the words of the psalmist, let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. As we join, the service is already in progress. Good morning. Good morning. If you are able, please stand that we might call one another to worship. Praise God for the joyous gift of a new day. Let us worship God who is rich in mercy. God has turned our sorrow and sadness into dancing and joy and transforms fear into resurrection love. Oh God, we will give thanks to you for heaven. morning and you may be seated. My name is Mark Gix and I'd like to welcome everyone here to Pasadena Presbyterian Church here in downtown Pasadena. A warm welcome to you all who are worshiping here with us in the sanctuary and a warm welcome to our visitors here who are worshiping for the first time in our sanctuary. You are welcome. And a warm welcome to those who will be viewing us lately on DVD or is watching us right now on Channel 32. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Passing the Presbyterian Church. This is a place of belonging, a place where we embrace diversity and we build community in our fellowship and we follow Jesus Christ to serve in transforming the world around us. 
We invite you all to stop by our visitor uh, center here and you're welcome right on the patio, right after the worship. And if you are a visitor here for the first time, please do stop by. We have a nice little token of uh, appreciation for you joining us here at worship. It's a nice little beautiful mug and something to take away from your experience here along with the worship that you have here. You will find in our pew racks, I also like to do the visual on this, a little card. If you're a visitor here, would you mind filling it out and giving us a little information about yourself and telling us what you think of our worship here? Or if you have a concern or something that we may be able to help you with, or just to say, hey, hi, and see any ways that we can help you along your spiritual journey. And if you are a member here and there you have a need or something that needs to be addressed, please fill it out if you have a change in information. Or if you just have something you want to say, saying, hey, that's really good. I really enjoyed myself in the worship. All comments are welcome. And please do fill out those cards. Today, the educational class will meet in Gamble Lounge following our worship today. Uh, today's topic is gun violence and leading the discussion is Virginia Classic. Huh. Uh, the co-chair of uh, the Episcopal Lutheran Gun Violence Prevention Task Force for the Diocese of Los Angeles. That is a long title, and I'm sure that she's going to be a wonderful moderator of that. Many of you may know her as she was a featured speaker at the Presbytery Peace Conference held at Knox Church in February. Uh, this is a both a relevant topic for this time, as we all know, because there's been so many instances of people who have been perpetrated by violence, especially with guns in this country. So please stop by and engage in a nice little topic and maybe get some further information or offer your opinion on the seriousness of gun violence here in the United States of America. You will find also in your bulletin a blue envelope, which I neglected to bid. It's for the deacons. I'm a deacon. Hi, all those fellow deacons out there. Uh, once a month on the first Sunday, we do collect an uh, offering for the deacons that helps us to uh, provide services uh, for those in need here at our church and to help us provide things with memorial services and, and that sort of things and flowers and stuff like that. So all donations are greatly appreciated. I also invite you to read other announcements in the bulletin that may be of importance to you in this coming week. In the life of our congregation, we have several celebrations and concerns. We like to celebrate, I'm going to try to get this name right, Thayer Scrivener, who has recently became a nationalized citizen here. Congratulations, Thayer. Uh, and there are those of us in our congregation who do need our pair, prayers. We pay attention to Cook Lee Kim, Jane Cambridge, and the families and friends of Mitch Carlos. And also for our pastor who's a little under the weather today, we want to thank you for pressing forward. I know the Lord will be with you in all you do and say today, and we speed you a speedy recovery, Reverend. Let us prepare for our prayers of confessions. When our soul was suffering in silence, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about Dr. Tim. How could I forget my friend? I'm sorry, Tim, I was reading a little bit faster. Doctor, doctor, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you, you know me, I just keep going. In your bulletin today is a very attractive and very colorful postcard announcing Ensemble Four. Ensemble is a program that we developed for Friends of Music four years ago. And this is the fourth one we've done. It takes as its premise the use of PPC's magnificent Aeolian Skinner pipe organ as a member of an ensemble. And we've done programs with orchestra and with singers and with brass ensembles and all sorts of things. This year's iteration promises to be a very special program because we are not only using the Alien Skinner, but we will use a piano with string orchestra, this Alien Skinner with string orchestra. And the repertoire this year is really fascinating. We are going to open with a piece by Carson Kuhlman, who is the composer in residence at Harvard University Memorial Church. And this piece was written by him two years ago and has not been performed aside from that 
so we get the West Coast premiere. We follow that with a piece by Benjamin Britten for piano and strings, and my colleague at Cal State Northridge is going to be playing the piano. This piece is by Benjamin Britten, and would you believe that it's the U.S. premiere of this piece called Rondo Concertante? Truly amazing in 2019 to be just now premiering a piece in the United States by Benjamin Britten. The anchor of the program is a piece by Leo Sowerby, who was United States born and bred, Chicago born and bred, and he has written a classic concerto for organ and strings that is hard, might I say. <laughs> but a wonderful, wonderful piece and underperformed. It hasn't been performed except once last year. I cannot find any reference to it having been performed for the last at least two decades in this country. So it's a program of newer and underperformed works. Ensemble Four in this building, 7.30 p.m. this coming Saturday, May 11th. It's free as all Friends of Music programs are and I invite you to come and bring your friends. Thank you. Again, my apologies, Dr. Hope. What a wonderful, wonderful director of music that we have here who provides us with such opportunities to enlighten us, both through music of the world and through the music of religion. When our souls are suffering in silence, we call out to the Lord, our God, who heals all brokenness, who lifts us up from the pit and restores us to life. Sisters, please join me in our prayer of confession as you found printed in your bulletin or projected on the wall. Let us pray. Resurrected one, you have proved that nothing can defeat the power of your love, and yet we continue to nurture our doubts. Time and again, you show us that your transforming love in which you gathered our despairs into your love. You are faithful and ready to heal us of our pain and pride, ready to give us wisdom and guidance, yet we ignore you, God. Call us again to follow you. We are like lost sheep, and we need your help to find our way back to you. Lead us from our fears to your never failing love. Let us continue our prayers in silence. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Cast off the shroud of sorrow and put on the joy of the Lord. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please rise.
peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us sure to sign the peace. We have a very special opportunity today uh, to hear a moment for mission. Uh, the missionaries from our Korean language ministry, the On family, is here for just a short amount of time and we wanted to make sure that you all knew about their um, time that they are using to serve God in China and Mongolia. So I'm going to invite you forward. <clears throat> You have in your bulletin a handout, an insert, so I do hope that you've had a chance to um, look it over and it will share a lot of the mission. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, so I'm going to introduce very special, our family members, overall our PPC, Mr. An and Mrs. An and their beautiful daughter together. So I'm going to cut it short. But I just want to remark just one very important thing. They're not the outsider. They're us. They're one of us. Let's hear their story. Hello, everyone. We came to Pasadena Jagnog in 2010. Hello, everyone. We have been a member of PPC since 2010. 이곳에서 안소 지사와 순장 등을 사역을 하였고 We served as small group leaders and deacons at this church. 2015년에 하나님의 부르심으로 어, 선교사로서 파송되어 중국에 가게 되었습니다. And in 2015 we felt God's calling to go to China as medical missionaries. 음, 중국의 단동이라는 곳에 갔는데 단동은 어, 북한의 어, 북한의 신의주와 압록강 사이를 두고서 마주보고 있는 그런 곳입니다. We went to a city called Dandong, and Dandong is a city that borders North Korea. 그곳에서 의료 사역을 하게 되었고 환자를 그 치료하는 일을 하는 데 있어서 마, 어, 말씀을 전하는 일을 할수 없었습니다. We served as medical missionaries treating uh, North Korean, Chinese and Korean patients, but it was impossible to directly share the gospel with them. 음, 말은 할수 없었지만 그곳에서 정말 사랑으로 진심으로 환자를 그런 대화여서 치료를 해줌으로써 예수 그리스도의 사랑을 전하는 일을 할수 있었습니다. But we try our best to share God's love through delivering sincere medical service. 그렇게 4년간의 사역, 중국의 사역을 마치고 하나님께서 다른 곳으로 이동 음, 이동하게 됐는데 
몽골로 가게 되었습니다. Now our four years of mission in China has come to an end, and we'll be going to Mongolia for our next calling. 몽골에서의 그런 사역은 어, 마찬가지로 의료 사역을 하고 이 사람은 학교 대학에서 학생들에게 가르치는 그런 사역을 함으로써 그 사람들에게 말씀을 전하는 그런 일을 하게 되었습니다. We'll be doing the same missions in Mongolia, serving as a doctor, and also she'll be serving as a teacher at international university, sharing the gospel. 음, 그곳에서 어, 사역을 잘할 수 있도록 기도를 해주시고 몽골이라는 나라는 많이 굉장히 춥기 때문에 그런 곳에서 건강을 주의하게 잘 지낼 수 있도록 한, 그런 기도를 받, 음, 해주시길 바랍니다. Please pray for our mission in Mongolia and also Mongolia is a very cold country, so please pray for our health too. Thank you. I'd like to uh, have a moment to pray for them before they're going out. So we are sending out to Mongolia for God's mission all together. So uh, you can, you can uh, raise your hand and spread your hand towards them and let's go to pray together. I'm going to pray in Korean uh, for them and Pastor Ann going to pray in English. Let's pray together. 하나님 감사합니다. 우리 안성교사님 가정을 주님께서 붙들어주시고 몽골에서의 사역 가운데 주님의 은혜를 가득 부어주시옵소서 주님께서 부르신 이 부르심의 응답해서 정말 담대한 마음으로 나아가는 이 가족들 가운데 주님께서 사랑과 필요한 것들을 채워주시며 그 모든 사역을 인도하여 주시옵소서 예수 그리스 도 이름을 감사하며 기도합니다 God of life, God of love, we thank you for uh, the On family and their call to serve you um, in China and Mongolia and we pray your blessing upon them as they return that you might use them in mighty ways, that you might use them not only to uh, heal, but also to heal uh, bodies, but also to heal souls as they share your love with them. Keep them safe, um, keep them uh, in your ever loving comfort and presence. We thank you, Lord, for their uh, life of service and how they are sharing their faith to others for, about you. We thank you, Lord, for them. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. We're so glad you're here. I'm going to invite Jose Marquez to come down and read the scriptures. I'll be reading from John 21, verse 1 through 19. After these things, Jesus showed, us, showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in his way. Gathered, gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out to get into the boat, but then that night they got caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know it, that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered to him, no. He said to them, cast the net into the right side of the boat, and you will find some. 
So they cast it, and now they were uh, not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciples whom Jesus uh, loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon said uh, Peter that, when Simon heard Peter that it was uh, the Lord, he put on some of the clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging a net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone off, gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire. There was no fish on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, "Bring some of the fish, and you have uh, you have caught." So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And uh, though there were not many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and break, uh, have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breaking breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend to my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not want, wish to go. He said this to indicate uh, the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations here of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In that wonderful musical, uh, which I'm sure many of you know, I've seen many times, Fiddler on the Roof, um, it, which is it's about a poor Jewish milkman in Russia in 1905, where life is as precarious as a fiddler on the roof, there's a song that Golda and Tevya, husband and wife, uh, sing together. Do you love me? I know some of you probably could sing it by heart right here. After 25 years of marriage, which is an arranged marriage, Tevya wants to know if Golda loves him. Because the promise was that in an arranged marriage, that after living together, they would eventually come to love one another. So Tevya asked Golda, do you love me? And Golda's first response is, why? Why now? Why are you asking me this now? There's a lot going on in our lives. Do you have indigestion? But she eventually tells him and how they have engaged in ordinary acts of their life together. She says, I have washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given you children. I've fought and lived and starved with you, and I've even milked the cow. And she ends by saying, if that's not love, what is? If that's not love, what is? Our passage also asks us a question about love. Jesus asked Simon Peter, do you love me? It's a question we have to be asking ourselves. Do we love God? So Jesus is now appearing for the third time to his disciples after the resurrection. They are at the Sea of Tiberias or Galilee. And Peter wants to go fishing. Now we don't really know why. 
But what, think about it. After what has happened the past few weeks, uh, there's been the emotional turmoil of Jesus' arrest, the trial of Peter denying Jesus, knowing Jesus, and then losing his beloved friend to death. But now, this remarkable, incomprehensible event, the resurrection. You know, Peter may just have needed to just go fishing, to do something that he knew and could understand. You know, sometimes when, after we've experienced a lot of emotional turmoil, you know, that ups and downs, I can't even imagine all of the feelings and emotions that all those disciples went through in those last days, those last weeks. Sometimes we just need to do something familiar, something ordinary. House cleaning, gardening, cooking, getting back to work. We have to remember that for the past three years, Peter and the others had actually left fishing to be with Jesus. So why return now to fishing? Why return now, especially now after the resurrection when seemingly great things are ahead? I think when you've spent your whole life doing this one thing like Peter with fishing, going fishing would have been second nature to him, maybe to bring some calmness into his life, bringing him to a place of familiarity and potentially of peace maybe some comfort to sort some things out. But I think the remarkable thing about this is that is where Jesus meets Peter and the others. We have to remember that they, they left all that they had to be with Jesus, and now Jesus comes to be with them and brings to them all that he is. He meets them in their ordinary lives as they go about doing their ordinary daily things. I like what Scott Hosey um, suggests about this. It kind of brings up some questions about why. Why here? Why on the beach? Why cooking a breakfast for just seven people? After all, he is now the resurrected Christ. After all, he is now the risen Christ. He could be anywhere. He could have been lecturing Herod or Caesar or Pilate. He could have been providing another large scale, scale miracle of feeding, not just 5,000, but double that amount. He is now the risen Lord. He could be anywhere but he has chosen instead to be with them. God continues meeting those he loves right where they are. But just as the disciples were slow to catch on to who he was when he was with them before, they are now slow to recognize him in their midst, even though he's already appeared to them twice before. But after a night without any luck, and only when their nets are full, that's when they see Jesus. With an abundance of fish, I mean, actually a ridiculous abundance and amount of fish, that's when they recognize him. And through the grace of this abundance, they are now fed by Jesus himself who has made a meal for them, bread and fish, and invites them to eat with him. The Lord, now risen, once again serves them. Once again, God shows his abundant love and grace for them, inviting them to this ordinary yet holy meal that he has prepared, a meal that goes beyond service to demonstrate true love and true grace. And then after this meal, he offers the same abundant grace to Peter. 
Peter, who has denied Jesus three times, Peter, who is continually putting his foot in his mouth this way and that way, Jesus now brings to Peter an opportunity of grace. Do you love me? I think it's kind of hard to completely imagine this scene. Um, three times uh, Jesus asks this, and it appears that Peter is hurt um, by the need of Jesus asking for uh, three times. It is reminiscent, like I said, of the times that Peter denied knowing Jesus, but I think there may be another way of looking at this. I'd like to hope that maybe this was not so much a test of Peter as a way of restoring Peter, a way for Peter to be right with himself, but also with those around him. Because as we know, eventually, Peter assumes his place as the rock. He assumes his place on which the church is built. So it is an important part that he feels restored as well as the others understand that grace given to him. It is a time of restoration that will lead to Peter's transformation. Perhaps we too need to remember that sometimes when we have to experience something over and over and over again in our own faith, that maybe it is not a test, as some will say, but it's a process of sanctification. It's a process of maturing in our faith. It's a process of bringing us closer to be the person that God intends for us to be. And so with that love and that grace, Jesus then asks Peter to nurture, to feed, to care for his sheep, to live it, to share it, to risk himself, to show the same love that Jesus offers to Peter. I think God asks us the same question. Do you love me? I think we have to recognize that this is a very different question than the question, do we believe in God? Believing may be our acceptance of a greater being, a creator, the creator of the universe, a redeemer. To believe that we have the promise of redemption but that is different than asking, do we love God? If so, what should our response be? What does God ask of us? To feed, to nurture, to share, to encourage, to show this amazing, restoring, abundant love and grace that we know from God to share it with those around us, people we know and people we don't know. If you look at the Gospel of John, this is really seen throughout his whole Gospel. John really wants us to know that God is in the business of providing us with abundant love, abundant grace. Even at the very beginning of John's Gospel, he says in John 1 verse 16, we read, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. God's grace is enveloped by God's love. And this grace comes to us not just in times of extreme difficulties and suffering, but it also comes to us as we go about our daily, sometimes mundane, ordinary lives. God wants us to know that he is not just a, a stained glass, untouchable God, only meant for sacred events, but that God walks with us daily to provide grace over and over and over again. Teresa of Avila puts it this way. She says, we need a Jesus in the kitchen amid the pots and pans of our lives.
I like that. Sometimes I think it's hard to see the abundance of God's grace in our ordinariness, but I think it also means that we have to look with new eyes and see with new hearts. A few weeks ago, I was sitting in my patio and I was reading, and I have a, a small tree, not right next to my patio, a little ficus tree, and I was reading, and then all of a sudden I heard a little chirping, and out flew a little sparrow, I think it was a sparrow. Um, I didn't think too much of it, and then I started reading it again. And then I looked up at the tree, and two more little birds kind of flew out um, of the tree. And then I started to look closer at it, and believe, I was quite amazed. There was probably about three dozen little birds in my tree, eating, full of life, and re receiving life from that tree. And they're all sitting right next to me, and I hadn't even recognized it until that first little bird had called out. It reminds me that there are places in my own life where I may forget, I may not remember, I may not look hard enough to recognize the places of grace that I have. And I think that's where God calls us. Certainly the places of grace that we all experience, whether it's family, whether it's faith family, whether it's friends, Sometimes the places of God's grace are right in front of our noses in the ordinary places where someone might bring you um, some flowers like our deacons do, where someone might give you a call to just see how you're doing, for the person that might be willing to sit with you when you're in the hospital. A person just takes time to listen to you. Possibly, though, it's also the one who takes time to to challenge you when you're going down the wrong path. Where have you seen grace in your own life? Where do you need to be restored and transformed like Peter? In the extraordinary places of life, just like we heard this morning with the An family, missionaries to China and Mongolia, in the extraordinary places of life, like we heard last week at our adult education class, those who are fighting for climate change, or today that we'll hear about people working to prevent gun violence, God's grace is absolutely there. But also God meets us every day in places that seem ordinary, but in the end are means to transform us into that new life. We just need to know where to look. God promises us to never leave us, to walk with us through all of our life, no matter our circumstances, no matter how far we have strayed or turned away from God. God's grace is greater than the sum of our mistakes. We are forgiven by God's abundant grace. If that's not love, what is? Amen. Amen. If you would please stand with me and affirm our faith together, please note that this is a responsive affirmation of faith this morning. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of the heavens and of the earth, creator of all peoples and all peoples. And all peoples. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Lord. God made flesh in the person of all humanity. God made flesh in the love and grace of all creation. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Through God and God, Jesus Christ makes his presence known in our peoples and in our culture. We believe in the church universal because it is a sign of God's reign whose faithfulness is shown in these many years, where all tongues sing the same praise. And because we believe, we commit ourselves to believe for those who do not believe, to love for those who do not love, to dream for those who do not dream, until the day when hope becomes reality. Amen. You may be seated.
Jesus calls us to feed his lambs and to tend his sheep. Let us show and share God's love through our offerings of our lives. Uh, ushers, please come forward.
worthy are you, O God, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Receive these gifts of thanksgiving and praise and use them for your glory and the good of your people. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Uh, well, Anne has asked me to pinch hit for her a little bit. She's not feeling so well, and so I'm going to be leading us through communion. Come to the Lord's table, all you who love him. We come to the Lord's table, opening our hearts to receive God's love. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up our hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. It is good to give thanks, God. O oh God, who is light in the darkness, we pray for those who live in places where hope is dim. Be for them and for us protection in the dark. O oh God, who is our comfort, we pray for those who live in fear, real and imagined. Be for them and for us consolation and courage. Give us your wisdom in times of stress, fear, and grief in times of temptation and danger. Grant us patience to wait for you and courage to be strong in your hope. With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and have kept covenant with us. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, who by his life, death, and resurrection opened to us the way of abundant life now and in the future. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. As we hear your call to gather us together to feast on your gifts of word and spirit, may we receive from your hand the blessed gifts of bread and cup. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Would you join me in saying the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. I'd like to invite our servers to come forward to serve communion.
Now join with me in our prayer after communion. Gracious God, may we who have received this sacrament live in the unity of your Holy Spirit, that we may show forth your gifts to all the world. In the name of Christ, amen. Please stand for our closing hymn. God's abundant grace as you go out to love and serve the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
You've been watching the service of worship from the Pasadena Presbyterian Church. The church has been broadcasting its worship service as a mission outreach in Southern California for over 75 years. We'd enjoy hearing from you with any comments you may have regarding this broadcast. Send us a letter to Pasadena Presbyterian Church, 585 East Colorado Boulevard, Pasadena, California. The zip code is 91101. And be with us again next week at this time for the Sunday morning worship service from the Pasadena Presbyterian Church.